blue. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming back to an exciting network operations free. Uh, and to start off with, we have uh, Jason Mays from Google, who is going to tell us about uh, machine learning in the next 45 minutes, apparently. So please give him a warm welcome. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to attempt to describe machine learning to you in 45 minutes, which is no easy feat. Uh, but first of all, I'm a creative engineer at Google. What on earth is a creative engineer? Essentially, my role is to investigate all the new technologies coming out, one of which is machine learning, but also other things like AR and VR and mixed reality and all this kind of stuff. And we work with Google's top 40 or so customers. And when they're launching a new product or service, we have to come up with a new groundbreaking idea to help tell the story of that product or service. Okay? Um, so obviously, machine learning plays a big part of many of the prototypes I create. And we're going to go through some of those today. So to kick things off, let's rewind a little bit to a little bit, a little bit in the past where there was a big revolution pushing towards the mobile web. And everything's got to change to be mobile enabled. Otherwise, you're going to be out of business. I'm sure many of you heard of that before. Um, and the same thing is going to happen with an AI-first approach, too. So every part of the industry is going to be affected by AI in the near future. And I'm sure many of you have heard um, these terms, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. Um, so a quick show of hands, how many people have heard one of those terms at least? Good. And now keep them up if you know the difference between all of those things. OK, everyone's put their hands down. Oh, a few people. Oh, OK, very good. Some people have their hands up. OK, good. So you're in the right presentation. We're going to go through some of this. <clears throat> First up, artificial intelligence. Essentially. AI is the science of making things smart. This is the end result, if you will. Or another way of describing this is human intelligence exhibited by machines. Okay? Now, this is a very broad term, and we can actually be a bit more specific where we are today. We actually are in a form of narrow AI. Now, narrow AI just means that we can do one thing or a few things as good as or better than a human expert can. Uh, for example, recognizing objects. And a good example of that is in the medical industry, where if you've got like a brain scan and looking for tumors, we can use machine learning to identify those tumors in the brain scans better than the experts. So now machine learning can aid those people, make those decisions uh, with higher accuracy. OK. So what else have we got? So we talked about object recognition. There's also speech recognition. If you use Android, I'm sure many of you have used the, uh, the speech recognition on there to do searches and queries. We've got natural language processing, which is basically analyzing sentences and finding like sentiment and that kind of stuff. Uh, there's creative potential, such as style transfer, which we'll see in just a few slides' time, how that works. There's predictive capability. So let's say we've got um, the square footage of a house. What's the estimated value of that property in a given region? So numerical prediction. There's translation between languages, of course. And then some of the more exciting stuff it lies in the res restoration and transformation. And the best way to describe that is an um, example, and on the slide here, you can see these faces. Now, the important thing to realize here is these faces do not exist in the real world. These have been generated by an ML program to describe to us what it thinks a face looks like. It's been trained on celebrities, since it's a little bit biased, but nonetheless, these faces are all made up and fake. They do not exist in the real world. Um, now, there's loads of cool AI experiments you can check out. Um, if you Google AI experiments, you can find a website we created that kind of hosts lots of web experiments you can try in your own time. And I highly recommend checking that out um, after the presentation. All right, so let's go ahead and define machine learning then. What is machine learning? Essentially, ML is an approach to achieve artificial intelligence, which we just spoke about. And it's the actual program that can learn to find the patterns in the data that you present to it. Okay? So it's at the implementation stage, if you will. Now, the important thing here is that these systems can be reused. So if I train a system to learn to recognize dogs, I can use the same code base to recognize cats just by giving it different training data. Okay? So this is very, very powerful, and that allows us to reuse the systems with great ease. Now, if you contrast this to what we had in the past, um, if we're making a spam filter for emails, in the past, we'd have lots of conditional if statements, as you can see here. So if the email contains a certain word, we're going to block it. If it contains another word, we're going to block it, and so on and so forth. And of course, that's not very good, because you end up in this war between spammers and programmers trying to blacklist all the right words. And that's very time consuming. You have to redeploy everything, and it takes a long time. 
Now, move forward to today with machine learning, instead of explicitly defining all these um, uh, words we're trying to, to blacklist, we just tell the machine learning algorithm to go figure out for itself what contributes most to the spam emails by giving it a million spam emails as, as evidence. And then we didn't have to explicitly program that ourselves and we just redeploy automatically on a regular basis. So, what about deep learning? Now, essentially, Deep learning is a technique for implementing machine learning, which we just talked about on the previous slide. So this is one level deeper. This is the actual algorithm itself. And this is one such algorithm you can use to uh, implement machine learning. You may have heard of deep neural networks. If not, we'll get into this in just a second. But essentially, deep neural nets are very loosely modeled on how we believe the human brain to work, essentially learning patterns of patterns uh, using their deep structures. So in summary here, you can see how these three terms are actually interlinked. They kind of build upon each other. And these go back to the 1950s, in fact. It's not been around for a long, long time. But it's only now that we're actually getting the ability to use these in real-world situations due to the increase in processing power and memory and all this kind of stuff. So we're living in an exciting time, and we're going to see some of those examples shortly. <clears throat> so next up, how on earth does ML work, and how do you train such systems? Whoops. <clears throat> So we're going to go for a hypothetical example. Now, I know you guys are all like network engineers and all this kind of stuff. So obviously, feel free to try and apply this to your own domain. But I'm going to take an example where we're trying to classify two different fruits, apples and oranges. Now, the first thing you need to do is identify attributes of these things you're trying to classify. So if it's an apple or an orange, maybe you will take the weight and its color. These are quite easy to measure, and you can sample these with relatively e with relative ease. Now, if we're to plot these two features onto a graph, um, it's a two-dimensional graph because there's only two features, you can have color along the x-axis and weight along the y-axis, and you can see that the apples would be the green ones and the red ones are slightly lower down here in the red and green spectrum accordingly, and because oranges are a bit denser, maybe they're a bit heavier, so they're in the orange spectrum and slightly higher up. <clears throat> okay, that's good. So that means if we draw a line, going back to our high school maths, between this uh, set of data points, we can say with some confidence everything above the line is probably an orange and everything below the line is probably an apple, okay? So you can actually treat this as a very simple, naive machine learning system if we could make a program that could calculate the equation of that line for us automatically, okay? And then we can do the same thing for an unseen example, a new one we've not seen before. If it uh, lies above the line, it's an orange. If it's below, it's an apple, okay? Now, <clears throat> What about the features and attributes? If you choose bad features and attributes, you may get a scatter plot like this. So if we chose ripeness and number of seeds, you may end up with a scatter plot like this, which is very hard to divide up. And that's not very useful for us to learn from because we can't split it in a meaningful way to make future predictions. And you may say, well, why would you choose these features? They're not very good. Uh, but in the real world, of course, um, it's not as clear cut as apples and oranges. If we're talking about brain tumors, what features are you going to use for a photo of a brain tumor, right? So it gets harder. It takes time to learn how to do feature engineering to extract the features that are most useful for your ML application to learn from so it can split the data up effectively. And also, most ML systems that we use and train these days do not have trivial data. We spoke about two dimensions. If we expand that to three dimensions, so three features, you may, you'd have to draw this in a 3D graph as such. And instead of using a line to separate the data, you'd have to use a plane, that rectangle there. So everything above the rectangle in this case is a cat, and everything below the rectangle is a dog. And if you extra extrapolate this further, because most ML systems use 20 dimensions, or 100 dimensions, even millions in the case of images, um, the math is actually the same, but you're just using a hyperplane to split the data up. And a hyperplane is just a, um, a plane in the dimension lower than the number of dimensions you, that you actually have, okay? But the, the math is the same, and that's all that's going on. But don't try and visualize it, because 20 dimensions is just too hard for the human brain to visualize. Um, cool. <clears throat> so it should be easy then, right? If we've got pictures of dogs and we've got pictures of mops, it should be easy to uh, categorize which is which, given that we've got all these kind of uh, things at our disposal. Well, it turns out dogs and mops can look quite similar. And um, it, this brings me on to my next point, which essentially is that the biggest challenge in, in, in ML is to find good, unbiased training data. Um, especially that 
for stuff that is representative of the things you're going to encounter in the real world. So if we're going to train a system to recognize cats, you might need to have 10,000 or so examples of images of cats, different breeds, uh, in different rotations, lighting conditions, sizes, all this kind of stuff, to give the ML system the best chance to learn what a cat actually is. Okay? And it's also good to be mindful that data is not always in the form of images. I've used images in these presentations because it's nice and visual, it's easy to see and understand, but data can be in the form of text, sensor recordings, sound samples, or whatever it might be. As long as it can be re represented in a numerical form, the ML system can then learn from it. The other thing I want to point out here is that machine learning systems can't predict things that they don't know about. So taking this very trivial example where we've got a system that understands about dogs and chickens. Uh, so here it's got a dog that's four kilograms, sorry, four legs, black and 10 kilograms in weight. And the chicken has two legs, is orange and five kilograms in weight. If we give it this unknown animal that it has four legs, black and 200 kilograms, which we know is a cow, it won't predict it's a cow because it doesn't know cows exist. It would call it a dog because that's the closest match it can find uh, from its knowledge of the world. So I just wanted to point that out, that things, it's not going to learn uh, things it, can, it doesn't, hasn't been presented about before, essentially. So that brings us on to neural networks. What on earth are neural networks? <clears throat> They're all the hype these days. But essentially, going back to biology, our brain consists of about 86 billion or so interconnected biological neurons. And each cluster of these neurons responds to certain stimuli. So when you see um, some fur, uh, a bunch of neurons fire and get excited when they see that pattern of fur in the real world. If you see some ears, another bunch of neurons get excited and fire when they see ears. And same for eyes and so on and so forth. And if all of those fire at the same time, so you've seen ears, fur and eyes, then maybe you've seen a cat's face. And then your brain tells you, oh, I've seen a cat. So in machine learning, um, artificial neural networks, very loosely modeled on the brain, work in a similar way to calculate probabilities that get excited when they respond to certain features that they see in the imagery or data that you're presenting to it. Okay? Now, the next slide, I'm going to warn you, it looks scary, but it's not. As long as you can multiply and add, we will get through this. So, <clears throat> this is an artificial neuron, okay? also known as a perceptron, and we're going to work our way through this. Now, on the left-hand side here, we have our inputs. Now, as I said before, inputs are always numerical. In this case, it could be the pixels of an image. Let's say it's a grayscale image. That means all the numbers there would be from 0 to 255, 0 being black, 255 being white, and grayscale all the way in between. Um, and then these inputs are multiplied by a weight. Now, these weights at the beginning are completely randomized. We'll get into why later on. But just accept that they're random weights to start with. Now, all we do is we multiply the input number by the weight, so 3 times 2 would be 6. And we do the same for the next input, 1 times 1 in this case, 7 times 3. And then we add those all together. Everyone with me so far? Anyone confused at this point? No? OK, good. So we add all those weights together, multiply by their inputs. And then we sum those up, and we add something called a bias at the end of that, which is just another random number added to the end, kind of an offset, if you will. And that gives you this kind of grand total that you can see in this yellow box just here. So if you actually work through this example, it gives you the number 42, OK? Now, the next stage of the uh, perceptron is that you then pass this number into an activation function. And an activation function is simply a mathematical function, or graph, if you will, that takes some number as input on its x-axis and then provides some output on the y-axis that you then output as the output of this neuron. So for example, if for this number 42, maybe we choose one of these activation functions such that if it's above zero, we output a one, and if it's below zero, um, it would output a zero to give it kind of a binary kind of uh, toggling, if you will. So in this case, it would output a, a one because it's greater than zero with our total here, okay? Um, everyone clear on the activation function part? Yes, any, any hands? Okay, good, good stuff. All right, so now it's going to get a bit more crazy. The next slide is now going to show you how these are all connected together. So don't freak out. But this is now an, um, a, a deep neural network, if you will, or a multi-layered perceptron. And what we've got here, each one of these yellow dots and each one of these blue dots is one of these neurons that we said on the previous slide. So they're doing all the same mathematical cal calculations you just saw, but in this kind of networked form. So let's run through this. 
On the left-hand side here, we have an image. It's a, a, a grayscale image, just like I spoke about before, and it's representing the number nine. It's a 28 by 28 pixel image. Now, if you unraveled all those pixels into a big, long line, you'd have 784 pixels. And those are going to be the inputs to our, our neural network, OK? So the first neuron, or perceptron, if you will, here, is going to sample each one of those 784 inputs. And instead of doing seven multiplications and, and additions, it's going to do 784 of them. So same maths, just a bit bigger. Um, and then the output of that from the activation function of that neuron is fed in as the input to the next layer. And this is why it's called a deep neural network, because it's got multiple layers in the system. Okay? Now, the last layer over here in blue is a special case, because we've got 10 here. And the reason we've got 10 on the output is because if we're trying to classify digits from 0 to 9, there's 10 possibilities. Okay? And that's why we have 10. So once the system does all the mathematics on, on the input data, you're going to get a whole bunch of numbers coming out here at the end. Okay? And we'll say that whatever is the highest number is what it thinks the input to be. Okay? And initially, it's going to get it wrong because it's not been trained. So first off, it might say, oh, I think it's a 2. And we say, no, that's not correct. And what we have to do then is adjust the weights and the activation functions in the system such that the things that were voting for it going towards the 2 are penalized. And we try and push it towards it giving a higher result on the number 9 output over here. Okay? So all it's, you'll do that millions of times with different input images, so different number nines and different styles, different handwritings, this kind of stuff. So you can learn the general uh, pattern for a number nine. And then eventually it will train the system to use the right maths to produce the highest output to be on the bottom right here instead. Everyone kind of with me on a, on a high level, does that kind of make sense, like what's going on there? It's just, just a bunch of maths going on. No, it's a shaking head. What, what are you confused on there? So it's not random. It's, so initially, they were random to start with. The weights were random to start with, OK? But after millions of iterations, with, with examples of number nines in this case, OK, we can adjust the weights such that um, they, are, they have a bias to produce a higher number on the output here rather than any of the other nodes on the output, OK? So that's all we're doing. So it's just adjusting the weights such that we get the higher output on the one we want given that we know it's a number nine as an input. Does that make a bit more sense? Well, I yeah. Guess I okay, okay, cool. So we might get into that later in the presentation, but basically, yes, you need a lot of training data. And um, oh, there's another question, yes. Why there are two hidden layers? So how, how, do you, so how many layers are there? That's a very good question. So um, I chose two in this case purely because I know it to work well. And this is part of the art of designing neural networks is how many layers do you want. Um, using more layers means more computation, more memory usage, and so on and so forth. So you want to be efficient when you can. Um, but this kind of 7-5 setup for the classic MNIST data set, which we're using here, it has proven to work well. And picking these numbers is somewhat try and error by the, by the programmer to find what works well for that system. OK. Cool. OK, so moving on, we've got not much time here. Um, what output can we get from these systems then? So we see how, what the uh, network looks like, but what can it produce as an output? So we've got the possibility to do a regression, which is basically, like I said before, predicting a numerical output, like the house example. Um, we can do classifications, such as is it a cat, dog, or human, that kind of stuff. Clustering examples, for example, um, on Amazon you might search for a toothbrush, and then we might recommend toothpaste to go with that because they're similar items. And then we can also do things like sequence predictions, so even numerical, or even in, in the case of words, we could train a system to learn what to fill in the blank is for this famous phrase. Um, now these are just some of the common outputs, there are others of course. But the key thing to note here is that this output must then be interpreted by a programmer and, do, and to do something useful with that output. So in this pet feeding system, if we get a result that we, we are 80% sure that we've seen a cat, we might open the food tray and let the cat eat. If we're 75% sure, we might not do that because we don't have the confidence that we saw the right cat. Um, and that's down to the programmer to, to decide, essentially. So 
the key point here is that ML is part of the bigger system typically. It's a small part of the system, but there's something that integrates with the rest of the system, in this case, a pet feeder. Um, so there's still a lot of other programming going on that um, integrates with the machine learning part of that program. Okay. So I get this asked a lot, what is Google doing with ML these days, right? So um, we've had an exponential increase in the number of repositories we have internally, almost 4,000 now over the past five years or so that we've been using it. And um, I'm sure you've seen some of these common use cases already. So in Google Photos on your phone, you can search for dogs. Even though you've not specified the dog being tagged in a photo, we can bring back the photos that have dogs in them. Um, or other things, if it's skiing, snow, whatever, whatever you might be interested in. Uh, Gmail and Inbox has smart replies. So if you're on the move on your mobile phone, we can give you a piece of text to reply with uh, instantaneously that saves you having to type it yourself because we can understand the context of the message. And then there's been some experiments into robotics teaching uh, hand-eye coordination, learning how to pick up objects using machine learning too, which is you know, pretty cool. And it's a notoriously hard task to pick up an object using a robotic arm. Um, <clears throat> There's other products using it, of course. I'm not going to go into all these in any great detail. You can see the slides afterwards. There'll be links to the slides. But there's a whole suite of products using ML in innovative ways throughout Google. Has anyone heard of AutoDraw? No one. OK. Oh, one person. OK, excellent. Very great. Um, so here is my amazing picture of a cat that I drew. And we've managed to realize it's a picture of a cat and give me the perfect clip art for it. So now everyone can be an artist. And this happened by asking hundreds of thousands of people to essentially draw things that we wanted them to draw, like cats, dogs, you know, trains, whatever it might be. And with enough training data, we can then train the ML system to learn all the differences between these um, examples, such that we can now predict with some confidence what you're trying to draw, and then fill it in for you automatically. You can try this online. It, it's, it works in the web browser, and it's great fun to play with. So do give that a go uh, after the presentation. <coughs> Uh, Soli, anyone heard of Soli? Maybe a few people. Okay, so Soli is essentially radar on chip. Um, it sends out radio waves into the world around it, and it bounces off things, and then uses machine learning to figure out what gestures you've been doing with your hands. And that allows you to have very fine control over small devices like your watch, for example. Now, you can also imagine a world where there is no screen, such as on your fridge or, or your washing machine, and they can just flick your hand or do some gesture and uh, do what you need to do with that, with that uh, interface. So things are heading in that direction, which is pretty cool. Um, Pixel Buds launched not too long ago. These have the Google Assistant built into them. So if I was at this conference and someone's talking to me in Chinese, I can hear it in English in my ears. And this is really, really cool. This is like the stuff of Star Trek for me growing up as a kid. And now we've got this kind of technology to actually do this kind of stuff, which is really, really cool. Um, <clears throat> next up, Google Lens. So Google Lens um, was announced at Google I.O. last year. And essentially, it gives you contextual awareness uh, on your camera, on your smartphone. So I can be standing outside the restaurant and hold my smartphone up to the restaurant front. We can recognize what restaurant it is and bring in the reviews, the photos, uh, the, the ability to book a table instantaneously without even having, having to step into the restaurant. Or maybe I could hold up to a flower and understand what flower it is just by opening up my camera. <clears throat> so how are others using machine learning? Um, good question. Now, just a kind of disclaimer, this is kind of like cutting edge research in some cases, so it's not designed to be used at scale maybe, but it's a good taste of, of things to come. The first thing is robotics. Um, this is a robot from Boston Dynamics, and it can do backflips. I've, I've got to put that in the presentation because that's really cool. I can't even do a backflip, yet we've got you know, robots that are better than we are at doing uh, acrobatics, which is pretty awesome. And if you asked me 10 years ago, are we going to be doing this now? I would have said, no, we've got way, way longer to go right now. But here we are, nonetheless, and things are progressing really, really well. Um, next up, style transfer. So here, you have a regular image on the left-hand side, your favorite artist in the middle, and then it will re-render your image in the style of your favorite artist. And the important thing to note here, this is not Photoshop. It's not a simple filter we're doing here. The machine learning is learning the essence of the objects in the first and the essence of the style in the second and then producing the output. And because that's just a mathematical transformation because of all that maths we saw earlier, it means we can do it very, very fast and um, um, yeah, move things around in that space to have slightly different effects, um, which is really, really interesting as well. 
video generation. Um, if you look at these at first glance, this looks like a beach scene, a golf scene, a train station. If you look at the babies really closely, you'll realize something's not quite right. The faces are a little bit distorted. Um, however, you saw at the beginning of the presentation the celebrity faces that are much better now. So this is actually an older piece of research, but aimed at generating small animated GIFs. So imagine a world in the future where you could just type in, I want a video of a guy getting on a train and the machine learning can generate a high resolution uh, video which you can use in your multimedia production or whatever it is you're doing. Uh, we're heading in that direction, it seems. So uh, maybe we're not quite there yet. These are like tiny little images and not quite perfect, but you know, things are heading in the right direction. We're at the very early stages right now. Um, next up, skip thought vectors. What happens when you train two systems to do two different things and then work together? So one system has been trained on romantic novels and the other has been trained on describing photos. So when you combine those two, you get, he was a shirtless man in the back of his mind, and I let out a curse as he leaned over to kiss me on the shoulder. Now, <laughs> clearly that's not what's going on in this photo, but if you can only describe things in a romantic way, that's what might happen. Um, so you, might, you can use this kind of stuff very creatively and uh, have a lot of fun with it too. Now, understanding images. Cameras are our entry point to understanding the world, as we saw with Google Lens and all this kind of stuff. But other people have been making things like the Thing Translator. Now, what this is doing is merging two ML systems. One is something that we can recognize objects, and the other is translation. So once we recognize an object, we know what the word is for it, and then we pass that through Google Translate or something similar, and we can get that object in the language of your choice. And this is a very now useful educational tool. And you'll see from the APIs I'll show you later, you can make this in a couple of hours. It's really simple to do. Um, and before, it would have taken us months or years to do the same kind of thing. Uh, treasure hunts are now possible, object recognition, won't say more than that on, on there. Um, now, dragon spotting is something my team worked on for the, the movie Peach Dragon. Uh, here we merge augmented reality and machine learning together. So when you're at home, we ask you to find a common object, like a sofa, a plant pot, a TV, something like this. And once we know you're looking at the object, we can augment Elliot the dragon into the scene to delight the kids and that they can send it to their friends and family and generally raise, raise awareness about the movie too, which obviously is the ultimate goal here. Um, so that went, well, that went really well. Um, the next up is predicting complexity. So identifying patterns and behaviors at scale. Now, how many of you played Go, the game Go? There's a few hands, good stuff. Um, so we've now beaten the world champion at Go with AlphaGo. It was previously thought to be an impossible thing to do with a computer due to the exponential possibilities of the possible play moves you could make. You'd need to have a massive amount of memory to do so. Um, but now with AlphaGo, which is developed by DeepMind, which is owned by Google, um, essentially they've now made a system that can uh, have a very good educated guess on what the next best move should be, even though it has not a complete uh, entire um, overview of the whole system. So there's a, I think there's a documentary online somewhere that goes into the details of how that works, but um, I'll skip over that for now. <clears throat> um, optimizing user experiences, so designing for context and personalization. Um, Spotify is a great example of this. So when you're listening to your music on Spotify, um, obviously they're getting all the signals of what you like from maybe the beats, uh, maybe the lyrics, maybe the artist, the genre the artist is, and all these inputs are then fed into an ML system that they can then use to predict what is similar to those things that you've been listening to. And then they can give you better recommendations overall, which obviously is useful for finding cool new music. <coughs> project Muse is a project that my team also worked on. This is... Um, basically merging fashion and technology. So what if we had fashion designers being aided by machine learning to help develop new designs? What would that look like? And this system tried to explore uh, that realm, essentially. Next up, conversing with users, natural interactions in our everyday lives. Um, another project by my team, too many of my team here, sorry, but this is called Disney Book Ears. Now, I'm sure some of you have children. What if when you're reading the book to your child, we can hear you say things like, and then the lion roared. And when you say the word roar, we can actually make a roaring sound from your speakers at home to really bring that book to life and uh, have a great experience with your children. Um, so Disney Book Ears did just that. And then if you've got the Internet of Things connected to your house, maybe you can show the lighting and other things as well for thunderstorms and who knows what else. So um, very cool, magical experience using ML for that. <clears throat> Westworld. We also worked on Westworld. Here we brought the character Aiden to life, 
And this is quite cool because if any of you have seen Westworld, Aiden is actually an AI bot, if you will, in, in the actual TV series. So to bring him to life in the real world is kind of cool because it's kind of one step towards that. And um, we made an online portal where you could talk to Aiden and ask him questions about his, his universe and his experiences for the new series that was coming out. Um, I believe that went down pretty well, like 400 odd thousand conversations and um, uh, went on to win an Emmy, I believe, for creativity, which is pretty neat. Um, so we've seen some examples of how ML can be used, but what products and services can enable this? Now, obviously, I work at Google, so I'm going to concentrate on what I know about. There are others out there. Feel free to use those too. But this is the overview of what we have right now at Google. So on the left-hand side there, we can see we've got the custom models. These are for the ML experts. You need to know what you're doing to use these, so TensorFlow and Machine Learning Engine. On the right-hand side there, we've got the kind of the web APIs that are very simple to use. You just send us some data, and you get a JSON object back, and you're all good to go. And we're going to go into some of those right now. So first up is a Cloud Vision API. As you'd expect, you send us an image, and we send you a response back of what we can see in that image. And we can do that as you will. What can we find? Well, we can find objects that Google knows about. We can look for faces. And if we can see a face, we can tell you what emotion we see on that face too. Is it happy, sad, so on and so forth? We can extract text from the image or optical character recognition. Uh, we can detect explicit content, uh, famous landmarks, and famous logos. So just by sending us a single image, you can get all this information back and then use that in some way to um, make something really cool. Um, the natural language API. Essentially, here you're sending us plain text, and then we are using things like entity recognition to tell you what we can find out that is important in that text. So by that, I mean uh, people, organizations, locations, events, all the things that are in the Google knowledge graph that we know about, we can extract from that sentence and give back to you so you can then use that for something interesting. We also have sentiment analysis. So is the, is the, um, the sentence positive or negative towards whatever it's talking about? And all of this is supported in multiple languages. Um, and we also support uh, syntax analysis. So you know, what are the nouns, pronouns, verbs, all that that make up the sentence. And then you can geek out on that how you wish to do something interesting there too. We've got the speech API. Uh, as you may guess, this is where you stream uh, audio to us. And in real time, we'll send results back of the text that we can hear in the audio. Um, and it's fairly robust to noise. We've trained it using machine learning in noisy environments like bars and pubs and things. So even when you're using this there, you're going to get decent results back as well. And it supports over 80 languages, as, uh, which is pretty impressive. Um, and you can use word hints to kind of, if you're going to make something like a, a video player, for, where you say play, pause, you can say you're expecting to hear these words to give it like an extra hint to make it even more robust as well, which is pretty neat. Uh, next up, we've got the translation API. So obviously, pass us some text in one language, get it out in another language. Not too hard, fairly simple, and of course, works in many, many languages. And then finally, here we've got the video intelligence API. So this is similar to the image API, except here you're uploading a video. Um, so then we can tell you where we saw certain objects at certain time frames in that video, OK? Um, so you can imagine how you might take this and make something like um, uh, a search engine for videos. We go, hey, show me all the videos that have pandas in. And now you can do that with your own data very, very easily. <clears throat> and all of these, as I said, can be tried out online in the web browser, OK? So you don't need to be a programmer, you don't need to be an expert in ML, anything like this. Just go to these links, and you can just drag and drop an image or use your voice in the microphone and see the results that come back to see how they might be used. <clears throat> TensorFlow. Now, TensorFlow is an open source machine learning library by Google just over two years ago. I believe it's one of the most starred repositories on GitHub right now for machine learning. And essentially, it contains all, it's a toolkit, if you will, with all the kind of underlying mathematical bits and pieces you need to make all those neural networks I was talking about earlier. Okay? Um, it's available now for any website or app, so it can work online or offline, and can be deployed in the cloud on Google's cloud stack uh, if you want to deploy it at scale. Um, we've also got Dialogflow, previously known as API.ai. It's got a bit of a name change going on at the moment. Uh, but essentially, this allows you to make conversational assistance. So maybe for your company, um, your first touch point might be to have a, have a conversation with a customer, and one of your teams have got to deal with that and then route it to the correct person. Well, in this case, you could actually just have, the, have it automated and allow people to talk in a chat box, and um, it will some can be bad. So from a South Africa perspective and Zimbabwe, 
it's actually worked in our, in our favours. Where previous um, governments, which were possibly corrupt or not corrupt, have uh, been kicked out and new regimes have come in. So as mentioned before, the regulatory side is incredibly tricky. Um, and understanding where, so specifically people doing deployments, understanding where is it open, where is it not open, and if it is open, what are the requirements around from a government perspective, what are the requirements from the ISP's perspective. And this is incredibly important because there's some areas that you'll go and say, okay, cool, Nigeria looks great, but what do I have to give up to be able to go into Nigeria? Those kinds of questions start being raised. So in terms of co-location, not much. <laughs> so it's still up and coming, and I think a uh, number of the, the issues specifically around power, um, skills, which are going deeper, and uh, the vast, vastness of the actual continent um, means that, yes, this will always be, be a challenge, and you'll probably find things very much centralized into key areas. So at the moment, what we're seeing is South Africa way ahead, and that's just generally maturity and openness of the market. Um, Nigeria is getting there, and Kenya is getting there. So for the first time, not only Terraco's neutral uh, data centers, we've now got operators happening in Nigeria from a neutral perspective, operators happening in Kenya from a neutral perspective, which then starts making it far more attractive when wanting to invest in Africa. So what are the, the issues around data centers? And this is, this is quite a fun one. Um, so once again, local skills, um, no local manufacturing of the key side, um, increased build turnaround time. So all of these kind of issues, and maybe more to kind of take it through to the realistic side of it, and it was one of the presentations I did, is especially around skills, is you would think of, let's say, something like maintaining a buzz bar. There will be a whole bunch of guys who can actually go out there and sort this out. And uh, we literally had for many years, well, not had, he's still alive, um, one guy who would actually go out and maintain the buzz bars because he's the only guy who could fit into the suit. So, <laughs> so we literally, <laughs> so he's still alive, don't worry, um, but we've, we're training skills and <laughs> people up, and generally we have to find that from the youth. So we generally do learnership programs, et cetera, to try and get people um, growing into these new markets because technology and data centers and internet exchanges and all of those were not actually possible five years ago. So what are the major failures? So we always say in data centers, major failures are obviously people. Um, the second side of it that we start seeing a lot around is the manufacturing, because once again, shipping. So, I mean, we've had a number of times when we would obviously purchase, let's say, generators, and they will arrive on site completely broken. And you would then have to send them back. And remember that turnaround time, just waiting for it is nine months. It arrives, and then you've got to send it back. The other side of it is, <coughs> not even from a manufacturing, we had this with our new data center, was we requested the generator, we waited for the month, nine months, it arrived and it was just an empty big crate box. <laughs> so we had to kind of go back to the manufacturer and say, thank you for this lovely box, but uh, can we please get our generator? And then once again, that's another nine month wait that you're waiting for there. So yes, opportunities, so I kind of use us as the example. Um, I got finance to say I'm allowed to show these figures. Um, but generally, yes, there is huge opportunity as long as it's within the right territory, the right space, and I suppose with the right openness and uh, mindset. But yes, we've, we've kind of really grown in a, in a rapid state. And uh, funny enough, within the next two years, that MVA figure, we, we're doubling up. So more than doubling up, actually. Um, where we're having to constantly obviously invest and grow, which is exciting. It's exciting for Africa. I mean, I remember kind of five years ago we used to speak to each other and have dinners without mobile phones, and now Netflix is a household name. Um, I hardly ever see my friends anymore without a phone in front of their face because we didn't grow up with those kinds of things. Um, Facebook used to go to a party, used to upload it, and the next day everyone would see where you're at. Now it's that instant tick, and I'll never forget the day that that happened. I thought something was wrong with my phone. So you kind of like double check. 
So yes, from a cultural perspective, the, the influx of content coming into Africa has been phenomenal and the uptake is incredibly quick because we, we crave content, we crave access to content. Um, so that, that uptake you generally see happen very quick and we see it on the exchange point particularly. This one, so I wouldn't suggest you drive this, but I thought to kind of put Africa into context and the distances. <coughs> so a lot of people kind of ask me, you know, can I deploy in Cape Town? Because all the cable is sitting there and I kind of go, oh, maybe Johannesburg makes more sense to start because there's more eyeballs and you can service multiple regions. So if you look at Cape Town to Johannesburg, you're looking at 1,300 kilometers away from each other, and those are two major cities. Um, if you're looking at, and I did that as a comparison from London to Frankfurt, which is only 782 kilometers. So just to kind of give you the geographic distance. Um, some people say to me, can I serve Kenya from Johannesburg? So going back to Amrish's presentation, to give you an idea, that's 4,287 kilometers away from Johannesburg. Um, and if you go to Nigeria, which I also get that question, that's 7,452 kilometers away. So to understand the vastness and, and the size of Africa, so when it comes to your deployments and looking at best investing in Africa, make sure you're putting it in the right region that can reach all these various um, countries without having to redeploy. IXP challenges, so to give you an idea, we started the IXP now six years ago, um, and we've learned a lot. So we didn't realize the magnitude of the growth and the uptake, so we had to constantly learn. So from our side is understanding what is an IXP even when we started it. I mean, I sold an ISP and then Terico said, please come get this IXP going in a very closed market, so, which was challenging when you're sitting across the table and so, to someone saying, you should peer and 24% of your revenue is going to disappear. <laughs> so yes, that was, that was quite, a, quite a challenge um, over many years, but happy to say Telcom AS5713 is peering at the exchange. So not enough license providers, eyeballs. So, and I've done kind of a quick overview, which I'll show you, show you coming in the next slides in terms of Africa and ASNs that are actually available. Maturity of the market. So I constantly do hear this as well. It's kind of, do I go and put a massive investment in and then hopefully they'll go online? Um, or do I sit back and let my competitors do the investment? It's really that chicken and egg, and it, it just becomes quite a complex thing from most of your businesses that we've actually worked with. Um, I think the other one, key one, is lack of true neutral facilities. So I think this is something you guys really need to watch out for, is there's a huge amount of marketing happening on service provider facilities, and ask the key question, are you gonna rate limit me on my cross connect? because they do do that in service provider data centers, um, cross-connect charges and turnaround time for cross-connects. Because the easy thing is they market themselves as let's say neutral, but it takes you three months to get a cross-connect in. And they say, hey, don't worry, I'm a service provider, just connect to me and I can do it in one day. So just be careful of those kind of things that are starting to happen. IXP costs, and so this is something that um, we're working with uh, a number of the other kind of IXP associations to drive. But initially when IXPs were launched in Africa, it was kind of, hey, let's look at the big IXPs who've been successful, Blinks, Amtex, DKIX, and let's just put the same pricing on there and we should be cool. And everyone's wondering why they're not selling enough ports. So, I mean, the complex, complexity around it, and I'll use the Namibian exchange as a, as a good example there, is launched, very excited, but pretty much you connect to the exchange, you pay a port fee, and then from there, you're actually just trying to get to Namibia Telecoms. So you're paying the port fee and you're paying Namibia Telecoms transit. So essentially, you're just putting a switch in the middle where you could just run a direct cross-connect to them. So it's, it's once again understanding the regulatory, territory, politics of, of each environment. 
So this was quite a surprising thing for me. So I thought, let me have a quick look at Africa. And when I first look at a glance and go, Africa only actually has like 829 ASNs versus uh, Hong Kong, oh, sorry, versus United States sitting at 17,000. Um, if I look at like a Hong Kong is 465, United Kingdom 1,800. So it really looks from the outset, oh my gosh, have we over invested and built these data centers that are way too big to service a market. So that could be the negative way of looking at it. The positive way is that it's, it's a new market and there's new entrants coming in and there's new networks on an ongoing basis. And if you chat to the Afrinic people, they are constantly doing applications. So we're seeing this number rise on an ongoing basis. So I'm one of these positive people. So I'd like to see that we're going to pretty much uh, maybe beat the United States at some stage um, in terms of ASN counts and open markets. So ASN breakdown per larger countries, and the reason I chose these countries, a higher GDP, higher eyeballs, etc. So South Africa, more mature market, obviously very up there. Kenya, 38. Tanzania, 32. Nigeria, 41. So personally, I was, I was quite surprised on that one because they, they pretty much have huge amounts of eyeball traffic, very large GDP, but still a lot of restrictiveness on the telco sector. So once that starts opening up, I believe Nigeria should actually be up there with, with South Africa. So IXP is rolled out. You'll see we have a huge amount that's actually covered the territory. Um, are they being effectively used? Yes and no, depending on the country. Um, so I think there's a lot more education that needs to go through this, which we're working through AFIX, which is kind of like Euro IX, but for, for Africa. Um, and we'll start getting a number of these exchanges actually being effective by A, improving price, B, making sure they're in a neutral co-location, and C, hopefully, um, through Amrish's work, improving the, the routing within, within those territories. Capacity considerations. So a lot of people get a fright when they see this telegeography slide. Um, if you don't negotiate, yes, you will end up paying incredibly high prices to, to get into Africa. So there's, there's a number of people. There's a lot of competition. We used to purely have the, the one kind of cable operator, which was pretty much the SAT3 guys, who held that pricing close to their hearts for many years, and that's why we couldn't get many of you content guys to invest. Um, and now we've got multiple cables and multiple cables coming in. So yes, you do have options. And if you need introductions, absolutely, we work with all of them. So happy to help uh, where we can on that side. So why is traffic leaving the continent? So once again, Amrish's side. And if I had to look at how it used to be kind of 14 years ago, is uh, we would have an ISPA, I won't mention, and they would go and say, hey, I'm going to launch this really cool network. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a switch and router down in, uh, in Telehouse. I'm going to peer and connect to everyone there. Then I'll come back to South Africa, and I will say, hey, I'm a tier one network. <laughs> And we had that for many, 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 many years. And there's still a huge, and, and a lot of people still to this day will market themselves locally as a tier one network in, in Africa. Just thinking because they have something that's outside on, off the coast of, off the continent. So yes, um, there's still a lot of legacy that is causing it to actually root internationally. Um, a lot of people are not understanding that like um, Cogent is listed number one. And yes, their pricing is competitive, but what does that mean for me as my client, as, as, as offering services to my user? How is that actually going to affect them from a latency point of view? Is this the, the right solution? Is it going to keep me sustained, et cetera? So we're on a big drive to try and keep African, traf uh, African traffic in Africa. And uh, hopefully that will start changing those things and we'll start seeing the CECOMs, the YOCs, um, the liquid telecoms, work on lines, etc., starting to move up to that, that number one point rather than an international sitting, sitting outside the, of the borders. Um, yeah, State and status quo. That's my biggest challenge at the moment, trying to get people to change. 
So, hats off to Angola. <laughs> I promised them after, after the, the certain slides yesterday that I would say hats off to them. But yes, they are starting to do, and there's a number of countries who are, who are actually doing this, that they actually are making changes. And I mean, you constantly, you see these slides, and you see Amrish's slides, and then you go, wow, Africa is a mess. You know, there's a lot of work that's being done quickly on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that's why I agree with Martin to say to Amrish, keep redoing that study, because the changes are going to happen very, very quickly, because the continent's always evolving. But yes, so there's a great example of a country that's, that's done small changes that has actually impacted an entire country and the way people operate. Takeaways. So I kind of like that picture at the bottom because obviously it's very African. So I'd say the lions are kind of us Africans and the buck are maybe you guys coming in. So, <laughs> so yes, just be careful. <laughs> So, yes, poor quality construction, we do. Uh, slow uptake from major uh, multinationals. Big one is political instability. Um, it may be good, it may be bad, and thank God in our case it was good. Um, currency instabilities, funny enough, I was having a huge chat this afternoon around do you get paid in rands or do you get paid in dollars, and how does that affect your business case when coming in? Or do you want people to charge you in dollars? All those kinds of things. Really start having a look at those, those, those kinds of situations. Variable standards. So especially with the, the data center side of things, is you'll send your RFI document, that lovely Excel that comes across. We put everything in there, nice big numbers. And then you guys go, OK, this is a cool data center. I think I can go and invest. And then when you arrive on the site, it's a different story. So really be careful um, around that. Uh, water and power infrastructure. So water, obviously a very touchy subject for South Africa at the moment. But uh, yes, from a, from a power infrastructure, we do have a lack of power. We have the ability to create power, but we don't have the, the lack of power infrastructure right now. Water infrastructure, yes, Cape Town, we all know is going through a huge issue at the moment around water infrastructure. And yes, that's affected the ICT market incredibly hard, incredibly quickly. Um, because it's great, if you don't have water, how are you going to cool the environment? Um, so start investigating those things when investing. And my big one is marketing the neutral versus actually the true neutral. And that's literally, it's a huge buzz in Africa. Everyone's just using the word, hey, I'm carrier neutral. And just using that as, as a way to try and sell available or leftover space. So I put some negative stuff there, I put some positive stuff. And, but once again, I'm one of these, these great opportunistic people and I look at the positive. And I've seen the positive. So I think the difference is, is uh, Africa is a world or a continent of opportunity. And I think it's, it's really be careful where you invest, how you invest, who you work with, um, and make sure that they're going to be someone that will go with you in the future. Because we've got some clients who have done four MVA type deployments. And you know, for them to actually go and say, hey, I'm going to pick up my infrastructure and move, they can't do that. So really do your due diligence around it. And I can assure you, um, once you are there, you will get the benefits out of that. Cool. Any questions? Any questions, anyone? If not, please give Michelle a big hand. <laughs> Next up, uh, Monsieur Alain Durand who's going to be telling us about uh, the Identified Technology Health Indicators. Did I get the name right? Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Next slide, in the middle. All right. So my name is Alain Durand. I work for ICANN in the office of a CTO in the research group. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our project, ITHI. How many of you have heard of, about this project before? Oh, a few hands, OK. How many of you are familiar with DNS? Much better. <laughs> OK. 
So uh, this whole project started about two years ago now. Uh, and one day my boss asked me, you know, I can we are looking at the unique identifiers on the internet, and uh, how do we know that the system of unique identifier is doing better this year than it was last year? So we embark into this journey of trying to define uh, what the health of the system means and uh, how to measure this. Uh, so we could have started by picking up a random collection of numbers and try to figure out something from those random numbers. And we decided against because I thought it would not tell us much. So instead, we started on the slow track of defining what are the problems that we are concerned about. And for each of those problems, trying to find what is relevant about them, what can be really measured about them. And then at the very last stage is finding data to go and measure this. So it took a while, and now we are at the stage where uh, we can actually measure things. So we have seven metrics that we have defined. Uh, I'm going to go through all of them. Those are really focused on the DNS. There's a parallel effort that is done within the IR community that is focused on the numbers. And there was a public consultation, a global public consultation that just ended uh, in uh, mid-December about that and some other set of metrics focusing on registration of numbers. Uh, they are mostly looking at accuracy, which will be the equivalent of our uh, M1 metric, this one here. And we have a number of others here. So let's go for them. First one is, well, we're still waiting for some data. I'm hoping to have them next week. But this is about the accuracy of a registry. Uh, what we are looking at is the number of complaints that the ICANN compliance department is receiving about the accuracy of a registry. So the difference between ICANN and the IR is we do not have access to the WIS database. It's held by the registrars. So we cannot go and verify any of it. The only thing we can do is an indirect measurement. And if people complain to us, we can notice that. And then we can count how many complaints we have. So next one is more interesting. This is about abuse. So abuse can be classified into four categories. There's phishing, malware, botnet, and spam. So we have a sister project in ICANN, which is the DAR project, that is looking at a, a combination of anti-abuse lists, things like spam house, serbal, and a couple others, and are looking per TLD or per registry, so per registrars, uh, how many abuses are being reported. So we have averaged this per 10,000 registered domain, and we do that across all of our TLDs. And uh, what we see, what our first number we can publish now, oops, sorry, here we go. No, no, wrong one. Oops. Yeah. Um, the largest one. No. Here we go. Bam is about 90%, 86%, 90%. The others are at least an order of magnitude smaller. So, botnet, malware, phishing, they count for about on average, four per 10,000. So if you have a domain, a top-level domain with, let's say, 10 million registration, when you multiply this by 1,000, that will give you essentially the number, the average number that you're expecting. So what we want to do is to track this. And hopefully next year, this number will be smaller, right? So next one. We look at the traffic at the root, at the DNS. And what we observe is that about 65% of the queries return no such domain. So people are querying and things that don't exist. Another 29% about are queries that repeat very often. And we don't really understand that. Uh, Normally, the query comes with a TTL, so you ask for something, and you should cache it for maybe a day or two. If you ask for the exact same thing one second later, one tenth of a second later, it's a little bit surprising. Not saying it's wrong, saying it's surprising. So we have about 29%, let's say 30% of queries that fall into that category, but we don't really understand why they are being sent. Uh, so we try to go into the details about the queries 
that uh, end up in no such domain. So we break this down, and there are four categories that we have. First one are the domain names that have been reserved by the IETF, things like .local, .onion. Those things should never leak to the DNS, but they do, to the tune of about 3%. Now we have a list of strings that happen quite often and account for about 10%. And then we have other things I'm going to talk about later that account for 40%. And this is really interesting. Let's break this down. Oops. Oops. Here we go. So those are the names that have been top-level names that have been reserved by the IETF. So we see like things like uh, uh, Onion, local, localhost, invalid, example. Total of this is like three point something percent. The biggest one is local. Okay, that's fairly significant. Next one is the things that are frequently leaked. So we find things like home, DHCP, LAN, internal IP, OpenStack local, corp. Those are the things that are not delegated by ICANN, are not reserved by the IETF, and that find their way to the root. So the biggest one is .home for about 3%. Now, when we remove all that, and we look at the rest, there are many, many queries, and we try to look at them and break them down by what is the length of the string that is sent to the root. And what we see is that there are a bunch of things that are either 7, 8, 9, 10, up to 15 characters long, very few that are from 1 to 6, and almost none after that. All of those seems to be grouped there. So we are not quite sure yet but we suspect that those things are algorithmically generated. So things like a program is going to make up a random number, a random name, and query the root to just to see if it is connected. We have seen a number of applications that are doing just that. This accounts for 40% of the traffic that is sent to the root. That's a huge number. So we'd like to do some more research to understand this. If there's only one big finding from this, it's like, yes, this is where the most queries are going to. So when we look at the root, this is great. We have a lot of information. But the root is queried by the recursive resolvers. And when they do the normal expected job, they will be doing some caching. So a lot of queries that we will not see simply because it's resolved directly at the resolver. So we try to do also some measurement at the local resolver, recursive resolver. And we're doing the same thing. Here we see that about 99% of the queries are for things that actually do exist, as opposed to only 30% in the root. So there's a huge discrepancy here. We're still trying to understand what it is. So now we're going to break this down into the same thing, ITF reserve name, frequently use strings and everything else. What we see is, this time this is local host that is being queried the most, not local. There's an interesting reversal. Here we see it's like five times more. At the root it was five times more, but the other direction. So we really see a discrepancy between what we observe at recursive resolver from what we observe at the root. It's quite interesting to us. So those are the queries that we see uh, for names that are not delegated by ICANN and not reserved by IETF. Again, we see .home, LAN, domain. Now, there's one caveat. So far, we have two sources to measure this in recursive resolvers. That's not enough to make a definite conclusion. So, one of the reasons I'm here is to talk to the uh, recursive server operators and see if we can collaborate with you to get more data to make this number more uh, believable. This one, uh, next one is some are similar measurement made at the recursive server level. We are looking at the parameters that are used by the, in the DNS packets. 
for example, what are the class of service, what are the type of record, how many are for quad days, for A, for SRV, for um, TXT and others. Uh, we can look also at things like, uh, oops, sorry, I got this wrong. Here we go. Uh, TLSA certificate for Dane, DNSSEC parameters. So we're looking at all of those things. One of the findings is TLSA has not much traffic at all. Again, this is only one measurement point. Uh, a bunch of others that we are tracking to. The last one of those metric is DNSSEC, which is essentially the number of top-level domains that have been signed with DNSSEC. And it's about 90%. It's fairly good. So we now have those numbers. This is the very first public presentation of those numbers. We will talk about it again in the ICANN meeting in uh, uh, Puerto Rico, in San Juan, uh, in about two weeks from now. Uh, and then we will keep reporting them. So we are working on a pipeline to automize, automate the collection of this data and automate the publication of this data. So we need your help. That's why I'm here. We have developed a tool that we can run on DNS recursive servers. This tool is open source, so we can look at this, and it's going to take a capture of the traffic. What we want to do is to capture one million DNS queries and response. So that's two million packets, one million in each pack. And analyze this and create some statistics. The tool is only going to export to ICANN the statistics that have been collected. It will never export any of the actual traffic being captured. So there's no worries about privacy and leaking out traffic. Uh, this tool works as a DNS cap extension, or it can work as a standalone mode. So some operators may want to simply have a probe that captures traffic, and then in a sandbox go analyze it. That works too. We have done that. The outcome is a CSV file. That file is very small, it's about 8K. And what we'd like to do is to export automatically this file, the CSV file only, not the capture, to our servers. So we have created an automatic system to do that. Um, so that's the tool, that's the uh, open source repository on GitHub. It's an MIT-style license, so I mean, you can do whatever you want with it. It's, uh, it's built to be compiled on Windows and on Linux, so you can run on whatever platform you like. You can run it in a sandbox, or you can run it live, depending on what you want to do with it. Um, one million DNS packet, or DNS query and response, how long does it take to capture this? Well, on a very small campus, it took a couple of days. On a bigger campus, it took about an hour. On a large service provider network, we think it's going to take a couple seconds. So what we would like is a couple seconds of your time to actually run this tool for us on a regular basis. Regular basis means what? Once a week, we'll, we'll be very happy. Couple seconds of your time once a week. So uh, this couple links, we have some experimental results there. There's a GitHub of a project. All of this is open source. You can go and look at it. So that's it. OK. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Is anyone willing to donate a couple of seconds of their time? Ooh, tough, tough audience. Yeah. <laughs> OK, please give Elena a round of applause. And uh, this concludes the third session of the Network Operations track. Thank you very much, everybody. So I'm going to be here like tonight and tomorrow. Uh, if you want to participate, please contact me. <laughs>